Coming up on the St. Paul Forum today, we have Andy Joy of the Eastside Neighborhood Development Company. We're going to talk a little bit about Harvest Fest and uh, development on the East Side. Thanks for being here. My pleasure. I really want to hear about uh, the Harvest Fest, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about the fundraiser that you've got coming up on uh, August 10th. And uh, I want to uh, hear about um, what's happening in terms of uh, commercial development and residential development on the east side. But uh, you, uh, you've been doing uh, community development work for some time. Right. Yeah. I wonder if we can go back a little bit and touch on some of your previous work. Sure. Well, around 1990, I started um, as a volunteer for um, the Concord Street Business Association that, oh. that later became the Riverview Economic Development Association, otherwise oh, known as RITA. RITA, yeah. Right. And um, I was there for 10 years, and um, after that, was appointed as the mayor's liaison. Mayor Norm Coleman at the time mm -hmm. hired me as the liaison to other community development corporations and also district councils oh. and also um, some of the ethnic um, community organizations. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was my job, to be the liaison, go to meetings, go to public forums, report back to the mayor and um, you know, alert him to some of the issues and um, some of the opportunities to work with uh, the community. And I was later reappointed under uh, Mayor Kelly, Kelly. and um, worked there for another three years. Okay. And following that, I did some um, consulting work. And one of my clients was Eastside Neighborhood Development Company. And that's okay. how I ended up working on the east side. Um, when I was with Rita, I worked with businesses on mm -hmm. redevelopment of their commercial properties, on the annual Cinco de Mayo celebration, right. other marketing um, venues, and um, startup businesses. I want to say that, that that time in Rita's history or the history of the, that West Side was, was a very formative uh, time for kind of branding and developing uh, the West Side, the District, El Sol, and it kind of as a destination. And the, how how did that come about? Well, um, we had spoken to a marketing consultant that said um, that that had experience in commercial district marketing and branding, okay. which is different than um, individual company branding. It's right. there's so many variables in commercial districts that you want to capitalize on what was obvious. And what we thought um, we really um, were known for were the Latino Mexican restaurants right. with Boca Chica right. and El Burrito and some of the smaller ones that opened that also um, created this destination. Right. So District del Sol, and it was um, intentionally named you know, um, a bilingual because it's district is oh, in English. Yeah, right. District del Sol, yeah. um, Spanish for sun, was more inclusive. Um, right. And then we started um, the branding around that, around okay. the, the name, and uh, hired a consulting firm to uh, create a logo. There were banners that were hung, and then yeah. some of the businesses started using the color palettes within the logo nice. and then the annual celebration also played off of that logo using yeah. the same colors and type of graphic designs so it all was part and parcel of the revitalization the festival was not a unique one day thing the Cinco de Mayo celebration was created the destination and the businesses around it and you didn't necessarily have to be a Latino owned business or a Latino business to be in that destination. So it, it worked very well, that whole branding. Um, and then the, when was the Wellstone Center built? 
The Wellstone Center was built um, after District Del Sol had been branded. Um, yeah. That came around in, I want to say it was like 2002 or three. Okay. I, well, certainly after um, um, the passing of Senator Wellstone. Right. It was in his that, honor. Um, that area has such a strong identity now, and I think the Wellstone Center is one of the anchors, that, you know, and a, and a draw in the, uh, La Clinica, mm -hmm. and um, right. you know, obviously some of the merchants and the restaurants. But. It's a beautiful building, and they use local artists. There's oh. a local West Side artist that did all that stonework on the outside of the building, nice. Craig David, and um, nice. it, it it really adds. There's a lot of art on the West Side. Um, that's another sort of part of the brand, if you will. Right, some murals. The murals and, and the mosaics and. It's a right. very unique place. So Rita merged, kind of uh, folded into NIDA. NIDA was more focusing on housing development, right. and but they are in the process right now of building a commercial property okay. that um, it, it's, it's multifamily housing, but it's on the commercial district at um, uh, Cesar Chavez Street at Robert okay. and um, they recognize that the success of that development will be enhanced if they deal with some of the other commercial properties and get a facelift if you will so they have recently um, applied for a capital improvement money through the budget process of the city and were um, it looks like they're going to be approved Great. for funding to do commercial redevelopment and um, they've asked ESNDC to help with that. Oh, that's yeah, great. Yeah, so we're going to partner on the commercial development. It hasn't been officially approved by the mayor or city council yet, but it looks like it's gonna move forward. Good, so I wanna ask you about your time with the mayor's office. Uh, um, the, the thing that stands out for me, for instance, during uh, Kelly's term was uh, the arrival of uh, the influx of our Hmong, Hmong population and um, his trip to Thailand to welcome them. Were you part of that effort? Um, initially part of it and then um, and then they brought in um, a native speaker okay. to um, to go on the trip and coordinate the meetings at the refugee camps and right. with um, the leaders and and there was an entourage of um, people from social service agencies and public health that also uh, went with the mayor yeah. and they were all um, they were all able to communicate in in the language yes. so that yes. was a huge advantage for the mayor and he had his own interpreter so that um, I was not directly involved in that just um, got him connected with the person at the state okay. that did some of the international um, ambassador type what, Visits. what are some of the projects that you worked on during uh, your years with uh, Mayor Coleman and, and Kelly? Well, certainly involved in the riverfront revitalization uh -huh. when I was in Mayor Coleman's office. Yeah. Was um, served on the board of the St. Paul Riverfront Corporation. Um, when Mayor Kelly um, was elected and, and took office, I worked on the arts, um, arts culture, and entertainment. Uh, plan for the hmm. city of St. Paul. Was that something new? Was that a new? Yes, yeah. that was a new initiative and we brought in a consultant and oh. that was really to highlight all the cultural, entertainment and art um, institutions in the city of St. Paul and right. I know the mayor was looking to make St. Paul an arts uh, destination point um, right. and it is and it and it is but it yeah. wasn't it wasn't really known when you look at Los Angeles or New York or Chicago mm -hmm. it was hard to um, really be um, identified as a cultural city yeah. and I think that helped and then also this um, when the school the conservatory for perform performing oh, arts yeah. came to downtown that was intended to be a a uh, higher level performance and um, musician school. And mm -hmm. I wasn't di directly involved in the school, but it was also part of the ACE plan that they called uh, arts, culture, and entertainment, the ACE plan. So you have been at the East Side Neighborhood Development Company for how long? For 12 years for now. 12 years. Yeah. For 12 years. And um, 
During that time, we, uh, the entire nation was hit with the financial housing crisis. Yeah. And our, yeah. the neighborhood that I work in, the Payne Phelan neighborhood, was second, the second highest foreclosure rate really? in the state of Minnesota, second mm -hmm. to North Minneapolis. Okay. And we really needed to put our arms around that. We um, did a lot of community organizing and engagement to try and figure out what we could do and what our limitations were. Right. Uh, not fully understanding what happened and um, we thought the first thing to do was perhaps foreclosure prevention. That wasn't always the solution for people to stay in their homes when the mortgage project products were outrageous. Yeah. The interest rates and these um, adjustable mortgage um, interest mortgages yeah. It was, they were not good products for families, you know, trying to make ends meet. Yeah. yeah. So we saw a lot of abandoned homes and yeah. then it hit the commercial district. And at one point at the height of our vacancy rate, we had 30 vacant commercial properties on Payne Avenue between Maryland wow. and uh, East 7th Street. Wow. We rallied, um, yeah. we knew that this kind of economy was cyclical. We knew yeah. that we had, that resource sources would come. We knew that property values had to be adjusted. We knew that there were people that were willing to invest. We just had to make it work. So mm -hmm. Eastside Neighborhood Development Company, ESNDC um, is the acronym. ESNDC went and um, we did a commercial property inventory with, um, planners and architects. Uh, we used Lunning Wendy architects and we went in and did an assessment on vacant commercial properties, mm -hmm. underutilized commercial properties. Mm -hmm. um, we had, uh, we organized a meeting with realtors, anybody mm -hmm. that had a sign up on a building on Payne Avenue. Mm -hmm. We got the group together and we started talking about, you know, what uh, what is the activity on Payne Avenue? How can we make this work? Right. And yeah. we really are undergoing, and we're still uh, trying to fill all those vacancies, but we're undergoing a whole economic restructuring of Payne Avenue, where we don't have the same types of businesses. We mm -hmm. And some of them are still there. Mm -hmm. Anderson Shoes is still there. Mm -hmm. Ace Hardware moved to a new location to make way for a... Um, community center and okay. we helped with that whole relocation and finance package. Yeah. Um, also um, Loeffler Shoes and Morelli's and mm -hmm. Yeruso's restaurant, These all these institutional restaurants that had a long history, they were able to survive mm -hmm. the, um, the um, recession at the time. Uh, also Magnolia's restaurant and then trying to recruit the newer restaurants to come to the area. If you're just joining us, you're watching the St. Paul Forum, and uh, with us today is Anda Joy of uh, Eastside Neighborhood Development Corporation. We're talking a little bit about uh, development on the east side and the upcoming Harvest Fest Festival and Parade. So for ESNDC, what, how do you think about your service area? When the organization was um, founded, mm -hmm. it was the District 5. So it's 35 oh, okay. to Larpenter to 7th Street yeah. to um, like Johnson Parkway. Okay. Um, but for some of our services, we're citywide and we're also working on a new initiative, Lead Free Minnesota, that's going to be statewide. And, oh, um, that's interesting. During, yeah. right, and we've recently found through studies, we, did, we didn't find it, but um, there are studies that show that there are high uh, lead levels in children that live on the east side, and we're, we do a, a lead window replacement program through Ramsey County and um, to remediate the lead paint that are in the windows. Yeah. And older, older houses older, with older paint. Exactly, yeah. and those older houses tend to have younger families and families, you know, obviously with children and the lead levels are a big concern. And when mm -hmm. the study came out, um, our executive director, John Vaughn, said, you know, we're already doing this work. I think we can expand it. 
So he's in the process right now of organizing a coalition that includes people from the state and the health department and other mm -hmm. organizations mm -hmm. that are concerned about this and uh, it's affecting children's health and ultimately their health when they're adults. Yeah. So um, we're, we're happy about that initiative. But that's statewide. The commercial work we do is pretty much limited to Payne Avenue and Arcade Street. Okay. And that's intentional between 7th and um, Maryland Avenue. Okay. You have the highest impact if you can have a critical mass of improvements happening in a, in a defined area. Okay. If you try and spread it out citywide, it doesn't have the same impact. So we, we look at focused area, um, a focused area that has the highest impact. Right, so you're looking at impact along that corridor, which can then have ripple effects through the... Exactly. The so we're fixing, we're helping finance with public money yeah. the, um, the redevelopment of individual properties. We okay. help landlords find tenants, yeah. or if somebody is buying a building and wants to operate their business out of that building, we help with that. Um, so it's filling the buildings and fixing up the buildings is our main focus. Now, once they're in operation, we want the business to um, be successful. Right. So then we get into things like marketing and events and um, um, other types of um, drawing attention to Payne Avenue. And we've, we've got some great restaurants and some great chefs on the avenue now. Let's say that I live in St. Paul and um, I've got certain places I'll go. Grand Avenue, Lower Town. What are some attractions on the east side to make me mm -hmm. come up and explore some of those restaurants and bars? Well, I think the catalyst really would be Ward 6 food and drink. Mm -hmm. When they came in with locally sourced food, good oh, recipes, yeah. an up-and-coming chef at the time, and then a locally brewed beer okay. um, was the catalyst. Now again we had the mainstays like your Russo's or Minnesota Music Cafe that mm -hmm. had been doing craft beer for many years but this was a new concept with with the kind of menu that they offered. Um, then we had Cook St. Paul arrive on the scene. The chef there who's the owner, um, Eddie Wu, it, it's a fusion. He has created a fusion of Korean food and local American fare. Nice. And it's a wonderful, very unique menu with, um, and his wife is also a baker. She specializes in Korean baked goods. So sure. it, it's fabulous food. And then you have not very far away is Magnolia's, an old mainstay that still serves the meat and potato type of menu and great sandwiches. Um, There's some Mexican restaurants. There's Mexican restaurants as well. Taqueria Marquez. I would say, and it's it's um, pretty competitive. Has the best tacos probably really? on the avenue. Nice. But there there are other restaurants, um, Mexican restaurants that are equally as good. Um, mm -hmm. There's Los Ocampos on Arcade Street, and um, uh, Sonia's uh, Steakhouse yeah. also on Payne Avenue. Nice. Um, one of the real jewel boxes on the avenue is Tongue and Cheek. Huh. which um, the chef, um, Leonard Anderson, who um, came from um, other esteemed restaurants prior to that, decided to get together with uh, another partner and his wife, and the three of them have created Tongue and Cheek, which um, unbelievable food there, just very fine dining on Payne if you, Avenue. If you're and, a foodie, that's right, what you're going to have. Exactly. I, there, there's a bar there. I want to say, is it Schleeman's? It's called Brunson's Pub. That's Brun That's Brunson's, Brunson's Pub. Pub. Okay. It's the formerly Schweitz's, and it had been Schweitz's with a number of owners. Yeah. Schweitz, the Schweitz family had sold it um, uh, several years ago, and it's been Schweitz's. They've, you know, the uh, owners that came after that um, had kept the name. And when um, Tom LaFleche and his wife Molly purchased it, they decided we need to change the name but maintain the character mm -hmm. and really has, um, that property has undergone a huge uh, 
redevelopment okay. inside and outside and okay. it's it and uh, but they kept the his, historical yes it's feel it's a beautiful a, building yeah. the exterior renovations were approved by the um, historic preservation commission and also the state has historic preservation office nice. approved the um, the enhancements made to the outside and it's I really nice. encourage you to go that's where our fundraiser will be on August 10th. Well, that's a good segue. So tell me about the fundraiser. <laughs> well, um, we used to have an annual pig roast. And other years, it wasn't a full pig. It was a, more of a pork roast. Mm -hmm. And it was catered by Kane's Catering, also on mm -hmm. Payne Avenue. Okay. This year, the chef, Chef Terrence, at Brunson's will be doing the pulled pork. But cool. Tom LaFleche has organized the other restaurants to participate then. So when I you see. get your plate of food on August 10th at Brunson's Pub, you will have potato salad done by Tongue and Cheek okay. and coleslaw done by Ward 6 Food nice. and Drink nice. and a Korean barbecue sauce that's created by Eddie Wu at Cook St. Paul oh, very and nice. greens by Judy's Kitchen across the street from Brunson's. So this, um, we really felt it's like a progressive dinner on one plate. And uh, so we're really hoping and I'm getting a lot of positive feedback by doing that concept. And I, I really have to credit Tom LaFleche, the owner of Brunson's, for coming up with that idea. And um, people are really, so we hope to be um, uh, selling there, out all our tickets. <laughs> absolutely. Is, will there be some entertainment? Yes, by a local group called um, Rice and Beans. Mm. And um, they're just a great band and a, and a huge draw. And cool. that brings Howard from the west side over to the east side. So we're all good neighbors there. Nice. Um, there'll be a silent auction. There'll be games like um, nice. the beanbag games and, and such. And they have a huge... Um, deck outside the restaurant that's enclosed and uh, we hope for good weather. So that's 5 p.m. to 8 at Brunson's Pub. So you can go right after work. Right after work. What day of the week is that? It's a Thursday evening. Okay. So if you're going away for the weekend, it doesn't even spoil that for you. Yeah. <laughs> now the reason that fundraiser is significant, proceeds from that fundraiser are going directly to help fund the Harvest Festival Parade on September 23rd. That's on a Saturday afternoon. Mm -hmm. And um, we hope to make enough money to cover all our, our expenses for the parade. Mm -hmm. But we are also recruiting sponsors. Mm -hmm. We have a cultural stage that's new to the event that is mm -hmm. being funded by the Minnesota State Arts Board. Mm -hmm. So it'll be um, a great day full of cultural entertainment nice performances, bands, um, locally sourced food trucks. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, we're really looking at the harvest as the unifying focus for that um, particular event. Nice, so. nice. Uh, what are the challenges in, in developing and really uh, developing and marketing a brand for an area that's so diverse? I mean, it's got there's deep history and there's some um, uh, strong kind of ethnic anchors, but it's changed over the years. And you've got the east side has has some of the most diverse population that we've got in the city. Does that make it harder to to kind of uh, define the area, or is that kind of trivial? It is challenging branding yeah. Payne Avenue and any consultants we have brought in over the years have said mm -hmm. you can't do pain and arcade oh. it because they don't intersect it's not like you know no, they're grand and victoria two, they're, they're right. two pair and they're yeah. two different types of commercial corridors huh. with pain avenue being the more historic yeah. that you look at in the architecture of the buildings yeah. and the just the width of the street alone it makes it a lot different than Oh, it's physic Arcade's, is it physically, it's physically wider than Arcade? Arcade is physically uh, wider oh. than um, Payne Avenue is is more narrow. Okay. So you have smaller buildings, you have um, less off-street parking, um. and you have um, older buildings that um, create a character, a special character of a that you're in a historic area. 
-hmm. more so than Arcade Street. So mm -hmm. when we have brought in consultants to look at branding, they always focus on Payne Avenue and its uniqueness, mm -hmm. um, but yet um, we haven't really come up with an uh, overarching theme. Mm -hmm. We've had attempts and we've had some good graphics, mm -hmm. but um, we, we're not there yet. And there is uh, an interest with some of the new business owners to make that a high priority mm. and start working on, you know, what what really creates this destination. Mm -hmm. um, one of the leaders that's leading the, the charge on that is um, Chad Medellin from Cadence Records and Coffee. That's a unique shop oh, in itself. Fun. It's vinyl records and coffee. Nice. and some bakery <laughs> items yeah and it's a great place it's become a community gathering place and Chad is really leading the charge on trying to create the new brand so we'll we'll keep you posted on its evolution okay well listen I, I was talking with uh, Tracy Nelson mm -hmm. and um, I promised her that we would talk a little bit about something that's new this year which is the uh, first annual Lions uh, Legion Treasure hunt. Treasure hunt. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the button campaign. Sure. And I think we're going to hear a little bit more about that in a future show. But sure. Uh, um, that sure sounds fun to me to have another treasure hunt. Right, right. And probably a little more challenging because we don't have any snow to hide the uh, medallion <laughs> under. But yeah. yes, this was an idea of Tracy's, and she actually brought in. Um, I, I don't know all the committee that's working on this, but I know that there is one person that's working with her that has done, um, has coordinated treasure hunts before and mm -hmm. with the clues and registering the buttons. So yeah. um, she's brought in some good people that know what they're doing. Um, so you purchase a button for $3, you yep. register it online, yep. you also have to look up the clues online, uh. and then as the clues unfold, then people start to hunt. Mm -hmm. um, nice. There'll be a dinner after the treasure is has been um, found and there'll be a dinner to celebrate that and the whole button campaign as I understand it will benefit both the Lions and the American Legion post okay. 577 on Arcade Street okay. and then they've also um, committed to supporting some of the cost of the parade as well. Uh, there's also a pancake breakfast. There's a pancake breakfast and all of the parade participants are invited to go there, all of the volunteers and all of the businesses from the Payne Arcade Business Association nice. um, are invited to go to the pancake breakfast. Then we head out to the parade and then there's an after parade party at the oh, American Legion. Very nice. But there are, there are outdoor activities happening at the Salvation Army, mm. behind Eastside Pizzeria, mm -hmm. um, at, down uh, land that's near Ward 6, and a parking lot um, at um, York and Payne. So mm -hmm. there'll be different um, types of celebrations happening up and around Payne Avenue and mm -hmm. on Arcade. Cade Street at the American Legion. And there are other things happening on the 24th. Mm. There's a 5K run okay. being sponsored by the Eastside Wrestling um, Organization and also there's Sandlot Baseball will be happening. Um, again, nice. we're still putting together the schedule so I'll have an opportunity when I come back to give you more details on everything that's happening that weekend. Well, Ann, thank you so much. You're welcome. Uh, uh, my really, pleasure. That's it for today's St. Paul Forum. Uh, join us again next week.